An altruistic organism is one that is capable of lowering its survival prospects in order to raise that of another individual. Here, one fool monkey gives his hungry companion a banana. He harms his own survival chances in favor of raising another's. However, altruism can be paradoxical. Since altruists lower their survival chances, why are their genes passed on and not that of selfish recipients? First, we must accept that biological altruism does not require conscious intentions out of your brain. For example, starving unicellular slime molds combine and those in the stalk sacrifice themselves for those in the fruiting body, which can float away to survive. This demonstrates that some forms of altruism must be engraved on the genetic level. There are three classical theories, kin selection, group selection, and reciprocity. In kin selection, Altruism can be explained by viewing everything from the point of view of the genes. Altruism between related animals can be viewed as a mechanism a gene uses to maximize its spread by multiplying the number of carriers and making them help each other, but not non-kin. The concept was made famous by Hamilton's scientific publications. He developed a theory mathematically which could predict the likelihood of altruism. B is greater than C over R, B being the benefit, C the cost, and R representing the genetic relationship between the organisms. For example, be one half of siblings and parents, and one quarter with grandchildren and grandparents. Next, we have group selection, whose modern rendition relies on a multi-level approach. It uses the price equation as a formal basis. From this equation, it is believed one can predict allele frequencies across discrete generations. It also takes account of variation of characteristics of a specific group in terms of fitness. Take this quite literal gene pool. These green fish are altruistic. These fish are non-altruists. The altruists will tend to survive as they have a higher delta Z value because their individual cooperative behavior increases group fitness. The formation of groups is by selection at the level of species genome. Thus, really, there is no conflict between individual and group selection. Alternatively, we have reciprocal altruism, which can be extra or intraspecies. For example, the little wrasse usually removes microorganisms from another fish, the grouper, even going into its mouth to perform the task. Robert Trivers hypothesized that not eating the cleaner was in fact strategical due to the difficulty in finding another cleaner. According to Trivers, altruism can be easily explained by the benefit that both animals get from these behaviors, even between species. Effectively, reciprocal altruism is a case of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Now to evolutionary game theory. In the prisoner's dilemma, there are two options available for each of its two participants, cooperate or defect. In a single round, it is rational for either participant to defect as they stand to gain more, so here each participant will want to take the apple at the other's expense. But the natural world does not consist of a single round of the prisoner's dilemma, but rather a number approaching infinite in which it is more rational to cooperate. Assuming competition is between at least two biological strategies, i.e. pre-programmed behavioral policies, the cooperative strategy under certain conditions will always come to dominate. Tit for tat is cooperative by default, retaliatory but forgiving, an ideal strategy, whereas always defect is selfish. Axelrod found that tit for tat tends to receive a higher average payoff in terms of fitness. To paraphrase E.O. Wilson, within a group, selfish individuals always win, but between groups, altruistic groups always beat selfish groups. The gene-centric point of view of altruism can be taken further to suggest that for genes to be passed on, they have evolved the ability to recognize replicas of themselves in other individuals and to cause the bearing organism to struggle for the survival of these replicas. In this population of monkeys, some of them have genes that give them green beards. One day, a threatening predaceous lion and disrupts their peace. All the monkeys quickly hide in the trees, but one helps the monkey slips in a banana and injures itself. It can only be saved if another monkey risks its own life. Most monkeys show no such interest as they sit safely in their trees, but this green-bearded monkey instinctively feels the need to save it and bravely leaps down, swiftly wraps the little monkey around its back and climbs back up into the tree depriving the malicious lion of a delicious dish of monkey meat. So basically, we're saying that altruism could be genetically carried and that it is exhibited towards individuals with the same genes. This theory could underlie kin and reciprocal altruism and could justify how altruism arose from natural selection. New genetic studies suggest that altruism can rely on the neurobiology of emotive behavior. For example, various personality features have been associated with the polymorphic site of the human oxytocin receptor gene. GG individuals experience higher levels of empathy than AG and AA individuals, which experience little empathy limiting their altruism. Oxytocin is produced by the hypothalamus and released into the bloodstream and brain. It seems to play a crucial role in modulating social and emotional behaviors. One of the hypotheses to explain this is that it could interact with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, attenuating stress and emotional responses. High oxytocin levels increases prosocial and empathic behavior. Therefore, genetic altruistic strategies have sculpted the evolution of life from sheep brains to slime molds.